Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and today we are speaking about pharmacotherapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We know of course that our main reference is the 2021 EEC guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of heart failure, but we have an additional source which are the supplementary data that give much more details about the clinical trials and precautions and tips and tricks related to prescribing specific medications. When you are prescribing a treatment for a heart failure patient, what are your goals? The first thing that you need to do is to reduce the mortality risk for this patient as we have spoken in the first video about the relatively high mortality rate for untreated heart failure patients. That's why we are sometimes concentrating on medications with mortality benefit, but also don't ignore that you need to improve the patient's symptoms, function capacity and the quality of life, which is the first thing that the patient seeks on the short term, besides reducing the recurrent hospitalization for this patient in order to reduce the psychological burden on the patient and also reduce the burden on the community healthcare system. We are going to divide the medications into two groups, a group of essential medication to be recommended in all heart failure patients and some medications that can be considered in selected cases according to the clinical condition of the patient so they are not essential for all patients. Let's start with the essential medications. We know the famous theory of neurohormonal stimulation in heart failure patients that includes significant stimulation of the sympathetic and the renal angiotensin system and that's why we prescribe medications in order to antagonize both systems which help to ameliorate the heart failure symptoms and reduce the mortality. The 2021 guidelines give class 1 recommendation for all these essential medications. Let's start with the ACE inhibitors standing for angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitor which are recommended as a class 1 to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and death. We have the famous prototype which is Captobril to be prescribed 6.25 mg 3 times per day up to 50 3 times per day but of course this high frequency of dosage interval affects its compliance that's why we usually prescribe the other ACE inhibitors like Inalapril, Lisinopril, Ramipril or Tarondolapril which all can be prescribed once or twice per day according to the used regimen in their corresponding clinical trials. The beta blockers have been approved for heart failure for more than two decades for stable patients in order to reduce also the risk of hospitalization and death. And when we mean stable, we mean that the beta blockers should be started in a compensated patient that is not congested and doesn't have lower limb edema. And the famous rule, start low, go slow, that we mean to start with a low dose and then go slowly with increasing the dose over one to two weeks in order to avoid acute decompensation. The approved beta blockers that have mortality benefit in heart failure are pisoprolol and metoprolol succinate which are prescribed once per day and the carvidilol which is prescribed twice per day. Nepivilol has been shown to have symptomatic benefits in heart failure but there is still controversy whether it has mortality benefit or not but apart from these four beta blockers the other examples cannot be prescribed in heart failure patients. And there is a general consensus that ACE inhibitors and beta blockers can be started together as soon as the diagnosis of heart failure is made. MRA standing for mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist which are the spironolactone and eplerinone they have both mortality benefit as they antagonize the secondary hyperaldosteronism which is part of the renin angiotensin system and symptomatic benefit as they enhance the diuretic effect. Both of them have the same starting dose of 25 mg once per day up to 50 mg once per day and sometimes in refractory heart failure patients we can increase up to 100 mg and we should emphasize that eplerinone is more specific on the aldosterone receptors that's why it causes less gynecomastia than spironolactone which may sometimes antagonize the androgen receptors. In the recent years, as GLOT2 inhibitors standing for the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors have been frequently used for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients in order also to reduce the mortality and symptomatic benefit as you reduce salt and water retention like dabagliflozin and empagliflozin. 
The DAPA heart failure trial investigated the long-term effects of dabagliflozin in comparison to placebo in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and NEHA class 2 to 4 despite optimized medical treatment and they have elevated nt pro pmp concentrations and estimated GFR more than or equal 30 ml and over a median duration of about 1.5 year with a primary outcome of composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. The dabagliflozin significantly reduced the hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality and also the all-cause mortality with additional benefits on the symptoms and quality of life and control of blood sugar in diabetic patients. But we need to mention that the survival benefits were seen to the same extent in diabetic and non-diabetic patients across the whole spectrum of hemoglobin A1c. So here the benefit is not limited to diabetic patients. The emperor reduced trial compared impaglefluzin to placebo in patients who have ejection fraction less than 40 and near class 2 to 4 despite optimized medical therapy and estimated GFR here was more than 20 over median duration of 1.3 year and primary outcomes the same composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure. It shows that impaglefluzin significantly reduced the combined primary endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization and introduced a decline in estimated GFR and it improved quality of life regardless the presence or absence of diabetes the same with dabagliflozin. But there was higher risk of uncomplicated genital tract infection due to the high incidence of glucosuria. Although there was not a significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality in the emperor reduced trial as in the DAPA heart failure trial, but in a meta-analysis of both trials, they found no heterogeneity in cardiovascular mortality. So the conclusion of these two trials that dabagliflozin or empagliflozin are recommended as an essential medication in addition to the optimized medical therapy for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction regardless diabetic status. That's why you need to tell your patient that this medication is for diabetes, but I'm prescribing it for you for the heart condition in order not to be confused with the patient. And here to diuretic and natriuretic peptide of the GLUT2 inhibitors may offer of course additional benefits in reducing congestive symptoms and reducing loop diuretic requirements. And both here have the same starting dose and target dose of 10 mg once per day for heart failure patients. And now with the medications that produce a revolution in the treatment of heart failure, which is Sacobatril Valsartan, abbreviated as ARNI, which is standing for Neprolysin Inhibitor plus Angiotensin Receptor Blocker, as Sacobatril is a Neprolysin Inhibitor. We know, of course, that it has a significant mortality benefit besides symptomatic benefit as it reduces salt and water retention and reduces afterload, as here the Neprolysin responsible for breakdown of the natriuretic peptide is inhibited resulting in increased level of natriuretic peptides. The famous paradigm heart failure trial compared ARNI to inalapril, not to placebo, in patients with ampullatory heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Here the patients were in NEHA class 2 to 4, elevated natriuretic peptides and estimated GFR more than or equal 30 ml. The surprise that it was stopped early after 1.4 year as ARNI significantly reduced hospitalization, cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality with additional benefits on the symptoms and quality of life, instance of diabetes requiring insulin, reduction of the decline of GFR, reduction in the rate of hyperkalemia, and also the loop diuretic requirements. However, there was higher instance of symptomatic hypotension and non-serious angioedema than in ilaparil patients. In the 2021 guidelines, ARNI is recommended just as a replacement for an ACE inhibitor in a heart failure patient. However, there is still some evidence on hospitalized patients that we can start ARNI for them before discharge as it was shown in the transition trial. And there is also a recommendation of class 2B to consider ARNI in ACE inhibitor naive patient as a de nouveau use and it is becoming more widespread of course in our ongoing clinical practice but needs further evidence. The recommended starting dose is 100 mg twice per day which is divided into 49 and 51 for Sacobatril and Valsartan respectively but we can start with a lower dose of 50 mg twice per day in case of baseline low prop pressure and we can reach a target dose of 200 mg twice per day.
And remember, before you start patients on Arnie, they should have adequate blood pressure, estimated GFR more than or equal 30 milliliter, and if they are taking S inhibitor, we need to wait for at least 36 hours as a washout period before starting Arnie in order to minimize the risk of angioedema. And now with the second group, which are the medications to be considered in selected heart failure patients. Loop diuretics have class 1 recommendations in patients with signs or symptoms of congestion in order to improve the heart failure symptoms, improve exercise capacity, and reduce hospitalization. The aim of the diuretic therapy is to achieve and maintain avolemic status with the lowest diuretic dose possible in order to minimize the risk of acute kidney injury or dehydration. And so, in some avolemic or hypovolemic patient, you can reduce the diuretics or even stop the diuretic use to avoid these adverse effects. We all know that the strength of evidence regarding diuretics is still poor and their effects on morbidity and mortality have not been studied in much randomized clinical trial. However, we should mention that most of the major disease modifying treatment trials for heart failure were already performed on a patients on a background use of loop diuretic therapy and this should not minimize the role of using diuretics in heart failure patients due to the significant symptomatic improvements in hypervolemic patients. An angiotensin receptor blocker is still not one of the essential medications in all heart failure patients as its role is in patients who are not tolerating an ACE inhibitor or ARNI, but those patients should be receiving a beta blocker and an MRA. We have of course the famous SHARM alternative trial which tested candy sartan in patients who were not receiving an ACE inhibitor and Valhefta trial which tested Valsartan in patients who already received before an ACE inhibitor. But we need to emphasize that no angiotensin receptor blocker has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality in any clinical trial. The three famous ARBs that can be used in heart failure are Candisartan, Valsartan, and Losartan. And we can notice here that Valsartan is prescribed twice per day, although we usually in hypertension prescribe it once per day because this was the testing or the dosing regimen in the Valhefta trial. Everpridine has gained much more fame in the last decade regarding treatment of heart failure and it has a specific situation to be prescribed in symptomatic patient with ejection fraction less than or equal 35% in sinus rhythm because it acts on the funny channels of the SA node so we cannot prescribe it in atrial fibrillation and resting heart rate more than or equal 70 beat per minute despite treatment with an evidence-based dose of beta blocker, ACE inhibitor and MRA in order to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. There is another situation in patients who are also symptomatic, ejection fraction less than 35, sinus rhythm, heart rate more than 70, who are unable here to tolerate or have contraindication for beta blockers, so this is a different situation, and also targeting reducing the risk of hospitalization, and those patients should be receiving also the standard treatment. The Shefta trial compared Everpridine to placebo in patients with ejection fraction less than or equal 35%, that's why this was the same cut point in the guidelines, NIA class 2 to 4, heart failure hospitalization in the recent 12 months, and sinus rhythm and heart rate more than or equal 70 beat per minute, and on evidence-based therapy. And it significantly reduced the combined cardiovascular mortality and also the heart failure hospitalization rates. We usually start Everpridine by 5 mg up to 7.5 mg twice per day, but we should remember that we need to start and up titrate beta blocker therapy to the recommended or maximally tolerated doses before considering Everpridine. Hydrolyzine and isosorbid dinitrate are one of the famous medications in heart failure, but here they have a specific situation. In patients who are black race or Afro-American with ejection fraction less than or equal 35, or sometimes ejection fraction less than 45 with a dilated left ventricle in NIHA class 3 to 4, despite treatment with the standard therapy in order to reduce the risk of hospitalization and death, this has a class 2A but also it may be considered as a class 2b in patients with symptomatic heart failure who cannot tolerate any of the ACE, ARP, or ARNI, or they are contraindicated like for example patients with creatinine more than 3 mg in order to reduce the risk of death.
the problem that affects the compliance to this medication is that it should be taken three times per day, starting with a dose of 37.5 for hydralazine and 20 mg for nitrate, up to 75 over 40 mg. Digoxin is also one of the classic medications for heart failure, but still having class 2b in the guidelines. It can be considered in patients with symptomatic heart failure, despite treatment with the standard therapy in order to reduce the risk of hospitalization only. We know of course that it has a positive inotropic effect plus rate controlling effect, but in the famous and old big trial, the overall effect of digoxin on mortality was neutral. That's why its only benefit is on the symptomatic benefit and reducing hospitalization. The most famous clinical situation to benefit from digoxin is symptomatic heart failure plus AF, as digoxin here would help to control the ventricular rate. However, we should know that digoxin has a narrow therapeutic window. That's why it has a high risk of digoxin toxicity, and so we should have caution in females, elderly or frail patients, hypokalemic patients, or patients with reduced renal function. One of the medications that gained attention in the last few years is Verisiguat, which stimulates guanine cyclase, the target action of the nitric oxide, resulting in increased cyclic GMP, which produce vasodilatation and so reduce after load. It may be considered in patients with NEHA class 2 to 4 who had worsening heart failure despite treatment with a standard therapy in order to reduce also mortality or hospitalization, but still class 2b. We have the Victoria study, which assessed the efficacy and safety of Verisiguat in comparison to placebo in patients with ejection fraction less than or equal 45%, NEHA class 2 to 4, and recent hospitalization, and it significantly reduced the combined cardiovascular mortality or hospitalization. However, there was no reduction in all cause or cardiovascular mortality. We usually start digoxin by 62.5 microgram up to 250 microgram once per day and verisiguat from 2.5 up to 10 milligram once per day. The last medication we are going to speak about today is the cardiac myosin activator omicamtiv micarbal, which increases the cross-linking of the myosin heads to the actin in the myocardium, resulting in a positive inotropic effect. It was tested in the famous galactic heart failure study, which assessed its efficacy and safety in heart failure patient versus placebo, and it showed significant reduction in the primary endpoint of a first heart failure event or cardiovascular death, but there was no reduction in the cardiovascular mortality and still not currently licensed for use in heart failure, but may be approved in the future. So based on what we discussed in this video today, we can have our take home messages that there are some of the essential medications that should be prescribed in all heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients like ACE or ARNI, beta blockers, MRA and the SGLOT2 inhibitors, and other medications that can be prescribed in selected patients according to the clinical status, like loop diuretics, ARP, digoxin, evaporazine, hydralazine nitrate, or verisiguat. So clinical assessment here is essential in order to decide what would be the suitable prescription for this patient. And we are going to have separate videos for these groups of medication regarding how to prescribe them based on the supplementary data in the 2021 AC guidelines. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for the next video in the heart failure guidelines.